In this video, I'd like to continue talking about the Sierpinski triangle, specifically focusing on finding the area of this fractal. And remember that this fractal is created by starting with usually an equilateral triangle and then finding the midpoint of each of the side lengths and connecting each of these midpoints with lines. And then notice that we have four equilateral triangles and we will then remove that middle equilateral triangle and that will be step one. Step two, we would repeat that process. We would find the midpoints of each of the sides. We would connect them with lines, though now we would do this in each of these three triangles. And again, we would end up with four smaller triangles and the middle one will be removed. And then that process will be repeated again, where each of these smaller triangles, we again find those midpoints and then end up with four smaller triangles and remove the middle of those. Now, after this process is carried out infinitely many times, the question is, what is the area of this object? or how much space does this triangle actually occupy? And to answer that question, we need to think about this step by step. So let's look at the process for actually creating this triangle. And we can call this step zero, this is one, two, three, and so on. And let's say that the area of the original equilateral triangle is equal to a sub zero, the area at step zero. And we could actually find a formula for this based on the side lengths, which we call them x. This would be the square root of three multiplied by x squared, all divided by four. This is the formula for the area of an equilateral triangle where each of the side lengths are length x. But in this case, let's Think about this a little bit less formally and just figure out what the area of this triangle would be, this Sierpinski triangle, if we just assume that the area of the original starting triangle is some constant, which we can call a sub zero. And at the end, if we want, we can plug in the actual formula. Now, the first step in the process of figuring out the area is to look at step one. And we can say that the area of step one is equal to three fourths of the area of step zero or this starting equilateral triangle. And you can see that that makes sense. Since we found the midpoint of each of the side lengths, we split this into four smaller equilateral triangles, which are all equal in size. And then we removed one of those. So we have three of the four triangles that we split this up into, meaning that we are left with three fourths of the area of the original shape. And if we look at step two, we can call that the area of step two. We will take each of these three remaining equilateral triangles and then split them up into four smaller ones and then remove the middle one, meaning that for each of these triangles, we now have three fourths of the area that it started with, meaning that the area at step two is really three fourths the area at step one. And if we plug in what we know about step one, we have three fourths multiplied by three fourths, or you can write that as three fourths squared, multiplied by the area of the original triangle. And if we want, we can multiply this out. Three squared is nine, four squared is 16. And the reason we can multiply this out is that it's a little bit easier to count up how much area is actually remaining. Since if we think about how many triangles we have that are this size in step two, notice that there are nine of them in black and we would have a total of 16. Since we have four here, four here, and four here, that's 12. But if we look at this missing triangle in the middle, if we were to split that one up, then notice that we would have four other triangles in here, though all of them are already missing. But the idea is that we have four of these triangles with 
for smaller triangles on the inside, meaning that we have a total of 16. So we have nine black triangles out of the 16 white triangles that are of equal size, or 9 sixteenths of the original area. And for step three, we will essentially carry out this pattern again. Step three will be three fourths of the area from step two. Since again, for each of these remaining triangles, we will split them up into four smaller triangles and then remove the middle one. And since we do that for all of those, we will end up with three fourths of the area from step two. And if we plug in what we know about step two, that's three fourths squared times by the original area, we are now multiplying three fourths three different times. So we have three fourths to the third power multiplied by the original area. And at this point, we can see the pattern. Essentially, each step of the way, we are left with three fourths of the area of the previous step. And again, if you want, you can count the remaining triangles. Three to the third is 27, four to the third is 64. And if we want, we can split up this entire shape into triangles of this size and count up how many we have since we have nine of these triangles and each of these triangles has three remaining triangles. Nine times three is 27, which matches up with the numerator of our expression. And if we count up how many of these size triangles would be in the entire shape, we would have to fill in for these white triangles, but we would count that there would be 64. And I'll leave that as an exercise for the viewer. But the general idea is that this pattern does make sense by just counting these. And if we extend this to say the nth step, we could go to four, and if we went to four, that would be three fourths to the fourth power multiplied by the original area. But if we went to the nth step, the expression would become three over four raised to the nth power multiplied by the original area. And this expression is what we can use to determine what happens as the number of steps approaches infinity. And what we need to notice is that this expression, three fourths to the nth, gets smaller and smaller as n gets bigger and bigger. This is an exponential expression where this base is less than one. And when we raise fractions that are less than one to higher and higher powers, the overall expression starts to get smaller and smaller. In fact, as the values get larger and larger, the expression starts to approach zero. And you can see that happening if we just look at the decimal values of each of these. 3 fourths is 0 0.75. 3 fourths squared, or 9 over 16, is approximately 0.56. If we look at 27 over 64, that's approximately 0.42. So we can rewrite this expression using the language of calculus. We can take a limit as the n value, the number of steps, approaches infinity. And again, we're looking at this expression, 3 fourths to the n multiplied by a sub zero, the original area. And this is just asking, what does this expression approach as the n value gets bigger and bigger? As this approaches infinity, what does this actually approach? And if we consider this expression, this can be written as a function. We can say we have g of n is 3 fourths raised to the nth power, and this is an exponential function. In fact, this will exhibit exponential decay. If we were to graph this, it would look something like this, where as the n value gets bigger and bigger, the function g of n starts to approach zero. So this part of our expression in the limit starts to approach zero as n gets bigger and bigger. And a sub zero is a constant. We could put in the formula if we wanted to, but it starts as some fixed number and that won't change since this doesn't rely on the number of steps we're taking. This always remains the same value no matter what it is. 
So we have zero essentially multiplied by a constant, meaning that this limit, this expression as the number of steps approaches infinity is equal to zero, meaning that the area of this Sierpinski triangle, the amount of space that it actually takes up is equal to zero.